Welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen and get us started. Welcome back to the Open Education Network's Pub 101. Please wave your arms madly if you do not see slides on the screen. Uh, otherwise, I will carry on and say again that we're so glad you're here. And um, looking at our time together today, I reflected on some of the questions in the chat last week and read through your introduction in our shared class notes and got to thinking some of you may be wondering if you're in the right place. And first, I want to say, yes, you're absolutely in the right place. Everyone is welcome here. And that said, I do have some additional ideas. If you're just getting started with OER and you're brand new, um, I have some additional resources because publishing, I think, is kind of starting in the deep end a little bit. So um, while, like I said, you're very welcome, you may want to um, familiarize yourself with some open education principles and ideas and um, also think about publishing a little bit later or maybe simultaneously. Uh, your homework after we met last week was to review unit one. We're going to zoom in on uh, accessibility and mindset as a practice from unit one. We're not going to cover everything uh, that was in there. So I encourage you to read through the units as hopefully um, there's a lot of useful information for your programs or what you might be thinking about as you think about publishing OER. But for the most of the time, I'm going to hand things over to Jacqueline Frank. She is the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian at Montana State University Library. She's going to be talking about accessibility as a mindset and a practice. And we should have plenty of time for your questions and conversations, some of your experiences in supporting accessibility, some of your concerns. And we will also introduce what is a totally optional alt text homework. But if you would like to practice um, describing images and using alt text and getting some feedback on that practice, this is a great opportunity. So if you are newer to OER, by no means do I mean to suggest a stormy road uh, with this photograph. It might be because I'm in California and desperate for rain. But I will say that I think a road or a path is a metaphor for almost all of our journeys. And so if you're just getting started on that road, you may want to consider focusing on adoption before focusing on authoring, especially if you're thinking about what to support at your institution. And so if you're looking for more information about OER beyond what you saw in Unit 1, you could think about, for example, the Creative Commons Certificate which focuses on understanding copyright and Creative Commons licenses. You could consider joining the certificate in OER librarianship offered through the OEN. Uh, there is a curriculum that is freely available online as well as a cohort experience where you work in mentor groups to develop an action plan for OER at your institution with a lot of support. So that could be a good fit. You may also prefer to read a book. Uh, you could check out Introduction to Open, edited by Robert Biswas Diner and Rajiv Jagiani, or maybe a starter kit. There's one put together by Abby Elder. And if you're looking for a video, there is a video by David Wiley at TEDxNYED. And I encourage anyone in this call to add their favorite libguides or resources for getting started in OER for those of your colleagues who may be newer. This is, of course, a very small handful of resources that are available, but I think they're all really great starting points. I will also invite you to office hours if you have not attended one in the past. They are informal monthly conversations about OER topics that we co-host with the Rebus community. And our next topic is how to engage leadership in OER and hopefully get their support as you develop programs. That'll be January 28th at noon central. We have two confirmed guests, Terry Galloway and Josh Bollock, plus more to be announced. And I have the link there, but of course you'll have a link to these slides after today's meeting and um, should have all the information you need to join us there. As a preview, the February office hours will be how to engage student leadership in developing your OER programs. I also know that some of you are faculty authors, so not necessarily librarians or project managers who are looking to develop publishing programs. You want to create OER for your students. And to you, I also say welcome. 
while acknowledging that some of this content may not apply to you or may be too detailed for you. Um, there's not a lot of how to write a book here, but we are working on that type of faculty author programming, including how to write a book, if you're uh, looking for that type of support. In the meantime, additional resources do exist. That includes an authoring guide, uh, mapping your open textbook authoring path is a presentation I gave to faculty authors in Oregon a couple of years ago. And uh, it really, I think, helps you set aside time to imagine what you want your OER to be and who your students are and just to kind of start reflecting and setting aside time to plan your path. You'll notice, again, a lot of time in OER spent anticipating, mapping, planning, trying to really be thoughtful as you embark on um, creating or supporting OER. Pressbooks is a popular publishing platform for OER. They have great user support, including an EDU guide. I mentioned the Rebus community who we work with on office hours. They're great to work with if you're looking for collaborators. Maybe you wanna find faculty at other institutions to help you work on chapters. And then finally, related to today's conversation, BC Campus has a wonderful accessibility toolkit. toolkit a lot of how-to information on how to create accessible OER. I will give a plug here to please review the units. A lot of questions came in that I think or hope are covered in the content in the units. There's a lot of templates, resources, other helpful tips. So um, this is just my friendly reminder that while Pub 101 is really flexible and I know there's a lot of competition for your time, if you are able to set aside maybe an hour a week to check out what's there. I think it will be really helpful as you get started. Finally, uh, as this young woman drives a bus, um, I thought that was a nice metaphor for kind of all the things. Bus drivers have to deal with a lot of things, people, roads, traffic, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. So if you feel like you're driving the OER bus by yourself or you're overwhelmed by what's happening here in Pub 101 and all the information we're trying to share at once, um, I just want to assure you, we are packing a lot of information into our time together. It does help to anticipate what's coming down the road, but also some of us, <clears throat> yours included, can get carried away trying to anticipate everything. And so I took inspiration from one of your classmates, Susan, I think it is, who, who in her introduction said that um, she wrote an OER before she knew what she was doing. And so I really appreciate that approach too. We learn by doing it and we'll do the best we can. And the best we can usually is not 100% of all the things. So please give yourself that room. So without further ado, that is my uh, welcome to your second Pub 101 meeting. I will now hand things over to Jackie. Yes, hello. And welcome everyone. Give me just a second while I get the slides up. Share. Awesome. Got the thumbs up. Thanks, Karen. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jacqueline Frank, and I'm the Instruction and Accessibility Librarian at the Montana State University Library in Bozeman, Montana. And I'm happy to talk with you about accessibility today. Uh, these slides will be shared uh, with you. They'll be linked from the orientation document after today's session. Today, we are going to talk about uh, some of the many accessibility challenges that are out there um, and then share some talking points about why accessibility matters uh, to help promote the idea of having an accessibility mindset and getting into that accessibility mindset. Um, and then we will cover some basic best practices um, and how to use them, as well as um, a couple accessibility checkers. We're not going to go uh, super in depth into all of it. If you need more information, I would be happy to provide you with more information um, after this presentation on anything that we covered today. 
And uh, finally, we will also share some resources um, and then further training options. And if you have any that you are aware of, uh, please feel free to share those as well. Um, either share them in the chat or um, if there's an appropriate time throughout the uh, presentation today. Um, I also welcome anyone to unmute yourself and uh, jump in with any comments or questions uh, or to respond to group questions along the way as well. We have just a couple polls throughout. Um, the first one, I wanted to first ask, what type of institution are you from? Are you from a university that has graduate students, um, a college, a community college, or somewhere else? And with the live results, uh, while the rest of you are, are submitting your answers, it looks like the majority of us are from universities. Um, and then uh, more community college from college. That's interesting. Um, and then a couple other institution types. Uh, so about what I expected, um, but thank you very much. And uh, so there are challenges no matter what type of institution uh, you come from. And in last week's session, um, if you were here, Christina noted that it can be more of a challenge to get authors to think about creating accessible materials um, and textbooks than it can be to get them um, thinking about how to create more diverse materials um, or resources. And in my experience, uh, there are probably many reasons for that. Um, but one of the reasons that I have seen in my experience is that people um, often think about accessibility as an add-on or something that they do at the end. Um, and rather than uh, thinking about accessibility from the beginning and kind of getting into that accessibility mindset. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. And one of the biggest challenges I see, of course, is time. Um, both having time to learn about accessibility and then uh, the time it takes to create accessible materials after you already know how to. And then uh, the complicated fact that it never ends. And there's no such thing as being 100% accessible. Uh, that is a really big challenge because what works for one person might not work for another person. Um, so that'll come up again later. Uh, but I will say the, the quote unquote extra time that it takes to make documents accessible, uh, that extra time does decrease as you get more used to doing it um, as an integral part of the process and as you think about it from the beginning. Accessibility can also require a shift in thinking to get into that accessibility mindset. Um, and it can require both the awareness of accessibility, best practices, um, and an understanding of how to implement them. So hopefully we will share information on that today. And then uh, finally, one of the last things that I see is falling into the trap of thinking that it doesn't have a big impact and therefore it might not be worth the extra time that it takes. And uh, I will just say that we are going to debunk that theory here in a little bit. So we're going to uh, briefly outline what we mean by accessibility versus universal design um, or inclusive design, which are similar terms you may have heard of. And uh, we're gonna situate them within the context of what's covered um, in unit one of Pub 101. So if you have not seen these definitions yet, that's okay. Um, but these are the definitions included in your unit one. And uh, universal design, it says, is the process of creating products that are usable by people 
with the widest possible range of abilities operating within the widest possible range of situations. And then inclusive design means that you're creating a lot of different ways for people to participate uh, so that as many people as possible can feel as though they belong. And it doesn't mean designing one thing for all people. Whereas accessibility um, can often refer to the design of products, devices, services, or environments uh, so that they can, are usable by people with disabilities. While there are some differences um, and there is a benefit to uh, making sure that accessibility focuses on being usable to people with disabilities. Um, there is a shared goal of trying to design content in a way that more users can access it more easily. Um, and that no matter what approach you are coming from, um, that's kind of the end goal. So now we can talk about uh, what it means to have an accessibility mindset. And often that comes from understanding um, both why accessibility matters and how accessibility, um, how many people actually benefit uh, from accessibility and these practices that we're gonna talk about. First though, uh, I want to open up our second out of three poll questions. Um, so I want to know, are you mostly supporting other textbook authors or are you thinking about authoring content yourself or both? And looking at the live results, uh, the majority are supporting others, which is, um, what I would have expected coming from this Pub 101 course. Uh, but then there are people who are either interested in just authoring um, and then quite a few interested in both. Uh, well, either way, uh, the goals of creating open textbooks um, is so that they can be more, um, that can be accessed by more people with fewer barriers. So whether you are authoring content yourself or whether you're supporting authors, um, hopefully this information will be useful for you. Oh, that was my slide about the poll. Thank you for answering that. Ah. Okay. So why accessibility matters? It turns out that one in five or about 19% of undergraduate students report having a disability. That's according to the National Center for Education Statistics. And you may have other statistics um, on your specific campus, um, but that's within the US. And also in the US, uh, about one in four or 26% of people in the US live with a disability according to the CDC. But if you really think about it, 100% of people will actually experience a disability at some point in their life. Um, that's according to Access Lab. And that's because accessibility can be permanent, but it can also be temporary or situational. Uh, so for example, a bad ear infection could really limit someone's hearing temporarily. Or uh, situational disabilities might be being in a really loud environment, um, and which might impair uh, your ability to hear something, or being extremely sleepy, which impairs focus or performance. And we also acknowledge and understand that accessibility is a spectrum and there is a huge variety of assistive technologies. Uh, so from, for example, uh, people use glasses and contacts 
uh, people use screen readers, um, hearing aids to mobility aids. There are lots of different examples of assistive technology. Um, we can't go over all of them today, uh, but if you have interesting examples of different assistive technologies that you're aware of, um, please add them to the chat because there is a very wide range. And as we mentioned before in the challenges, what works for one person does not work for another person, um, often because there is such a wide range of assistive technology. And so the ultimate goal, um, or a, not goal, a good takeaway, um, is to provide as many formats and options as possible. Um, that's one best practice that allows users to choose what works best for them. So for example, uh, you can check that the original document, um, when someone is creating or authoring a textbook, you can check that that original document follows the best practices that we're gonna talk about here in just a second. And then you can save and publish the final uh, textbook in multiple formats, such as EPUB, an HTML, and a PDF version. That can be done from Google Docs. It can be done from Word. I would guess it's an option with Pressbooks. I've never used Pressbooks. Um, if someone, I see a, a head nodding. Um, and so uh, most, most places that's an option to save and publish as multiple formats. And ultimately increasing accessibility benefits everyone. Uh, so when we think about who benefits and is it really worth taking the time, um, everyone benefits in the end from all of these accessibility best practices. Um, some good examples are um, Sometimes things are designed for users with disabilities, um, but then are very helpful for everyone. So closed captions, for example, um, is really helpful for users who are in a loud environment and they don't have headphones um, and you can read it, um, or alternatively um, in a very quiet environment, um, potentially without headphones either. And uh, transcripts allow users to read the content without seeing a video um, and can also be read using assistive technology uh, with glasses, magnification, a screen reader, a braille device, um, or many other different options as well. So let's dig into some of these accessibility best practices. And before we jump in, I want to ask my last question, uh, how much accessibility knowledge and or experience do you, um, do you have? Zero, low, moderate, or advanced? and we're kind of in a mix between low and moderate. A couple people mark themselves as advanced, uh, which is, and that's about the level uh, that we are trying uh, to meet you at. Um, we're trying to give kind of a, a broad introduction so you know a lot of different things to be aware of. Um, and then we're gonna talk about a couple more of the nitty gritty uh, best practices uh, to be aware of next. So first, who's responsible for accessibility? Uh, I will put a caveat in here. I'm not a lawyer. I cannot provide legal advice. Um, but generally, the, uh, the content creator or the author of the content um, is responsible for meeting accessibility standards. Um, and however, Publishers, uh, we also want to make sure that we publish accessible content um, and that the content we're providing to users 
is accessible. Um, and so knowing what to look for and then knowing what resources to provide back to authors if needed um, is really helpful. And then for those of you authoring an open textbook yourself, uh, you may need to follow these best practices. Uh, for those of you who marked yourself more moderate or advanced, um, if you have additional information uh, to share um, as we're going through this, please feel free to do so. Because I know I'm not the only one uh, who has experience with these things. We can't cover all the best practices, so we're going to cover some of the most common best practices from the WCAG 2.0 or the Web Accessibility Guidelines uh, from W3C, and that's the industry standard. And we'll start with headings. And if there are questions along the way, uh, please let me know. Uh, we, we, will, we will have time to address them at the end too. So headings are a formatting tool and headings are used to separate sections of a document or a textbook uh, so that users and screen readers can navigate by sections quickly. The importance of having a well-structured textbook is also covered in unit one. Um, so there's more information there, but headings help provide that structure to the textbook. And they ultimately help guide uh, the user through the content easily. Headings should be applied in an outline format. And the title of the textbook uh, would be applied as heading one. And then all of the chapters uh, would be heading twos. And then all of the sub chapters uh, would be heading threes and so on. And so to do this in Word, for example, um, you just highlight the text of uh, what you want to be the heading. And then in the top ribbon, um, there are options to choose the heading style that you want. In Google Docs, you also highlight the text from the heading um, and then use the drop down menu in the toolbar. And that drop down menu will start with uh, what is called normal text. Um, and then it will have a list of all of the heading style you want. And if we have time and you want to see examples of exactly how to do this, I'd be happy to show you at the end. For hyperlinks, uh, you want your users to know where the link is going to take them and avoid pasting the entire long URL, which often has a string of special characters in it. And that, uh, so for example, if a screen reader comes to the link, it will read um, the text that appears. So if you just paste in the entire long URL, it will read out all of those special characters and everything as well. Uh, you also want to avoid using the text click here as a link um, and instead let the link be the title of the content itself. Um, so instead of saying uh, to go to the MSU library website, click here, um, you would just say see more information on the MSU website with the MSU website being the URL. And to do that, in most cases, um, it means typing out the text that you want to function as your link, then highlight the text, right click, choose hyperlink, um, and then paste in the URL where you want it to take you. When thinking about color, you want to ensure that the document has high color contrast, um, and that is for text as well as diagrams and charts um, and even photos um, if they are very important. You also don't want to convey meaning with color alone. So for example, if you want to highlight an important 
uh, sentence of the text. Make the text a different color and bold it uh, so that someone who was colorblind would also be able to see that emphasis. And for color contrast, uh, there are some accessibility checkers that can be used. Uh, we're going to talk about accessibility checkers. Um, and I will say, if you just stick to, you know, black and white text or like very, very dark color, very dark blue, um, you know, those very high contrast ones, you don't have to check. But if you are, um, if you have lots of charts, um, if you use um, different, multiple different colors within your document, um, it's good to just check those uh, to make sure that they meet color contrast. And again, we'll talk about those checkers at the end here. Captions and transcripts are both important aspects of accessibility. Um, and they are both for audiovisual content. They may be included, um, sorry, audio and visual content may be included in your open textbook. Uh, it may link to it. Um, and that's one of the benefits of uh, publishing open textbooks. Um, with different formats is that you can include uh, lots of different content in them. And so if you are including audiovisual content, um, think about captions and transcripts. Captions allow audio and video to be accessible for people with hearing impairments or uh, with, for people without access to audio. They, also benefit people who speak English as a second language um, or for people in noisy environments or quiet environments like we talked about earlier. And if you are recording videos, you can generate automatic captions using YouTube as one option. Uh, you may have access to other software uh, through your institution, um, but YouTube is one option that can be used for free. Transcripts benefit people with vision impairments uh, who don't, or for people who don't have access to video. Transcripts are a separate written document of the audio, and they allow users to read the content. Um, and so they can be read with assistive technology, such as a braille device or screen readers. They do not have to be verbatim accounts of what is spoken. Um, they should be very close and provide the same content, um, but it doesn't have to be word for word. And so they can written, they can be written beforehand if that's easier for you. Transcripts are also searchable by all users. Um, and so they can be really helpful for trying to search for a specific part of a video that describes something. Um, and if you're trying to go back and watch an hour long video and find that exact spot, uh, having a transcript to quickly do a search um, and see where it talks about it can be really helpful. Alternative text uh, is a written description of an image and serves several functions. It is read by screen readers in place of an image and the alt text is also displayed in web browsers if the image file doesn't load or if a user has chosen to not view images. Um, so for example, at my institution, if I log into a web browser and look at my email, by default, um, it hides any images that come through on the email. Um, and so I see a lot of alt text. Um, and then there's an option to download the images. Uh, so some of you may have seen that as well. To add alt text, most often you first add your image, then you can right click on it um, and find an option to add alt text. When adding a description, uh, considering context is a good uh, first check. 
if it is purely decorative and doesn't add any information, you might be able to uh, check a box that says decorative image, uh, depending on the software you're using. If that option is not there, uh, then place, um, or if the image does provide information or context, um, then enter in generally a one to two sentence uh, description and try to be try to be concise, uh, try to be objective and not to interpret or analyze anything. Um, and then it's also a best practice to uh, try to write in the same style and using same similar terminology as um, the surrounding text. So don't use a completely different writing style. And if it is a chart or graph, uh, you can describe them as much as possible. Um, but then the best practice for charts um, and graphs is to actually also link to the full data table. You can either include that in the text or as an appendix um, that you can link to. There is an optional homework assignment. Uh, oh. I should, those were my guidelines that I just went through. Um, I'll make sure I'm making sure. Oh, I did not mention this one. Uh, try not to repeat information provided elsewhere um, on the page. So that gets at the, what additional information is this, inf is this image trying to uh, portray? And there is an optional homework assignment uh, to test your alt text skills. And um, it's for writing an alt tag for one of the images that uh, is in this open textbook. This is linked from your orientation document, the same place with everything else. Um, and there are some additional details in unit one um, as far as uh, some guidelines for writing alt text. Um, so if you are doing this homework assignment um, and want some information to refer back to, um, that is in unit one under the accessibility portion. And then secondly, uh, while we're talking about homework, there is also this video on should you publish. So a quick note on open textbook formats. There are lots of different uh, formats and we don't have time to really dig into all of this. Um, this information is likely provided um, in other places in your curriculum. And if you want information specifically related to accessibility, of different formats. Um, I can provide some more information for you after the fact. Uh, but the main takeaway is there are lots of different formats and they all have different accessibility considerations. So for example, um, some uh, formats allow you to enlarge the text size and will automatically reflow the content. And uh, some, for example, PDF, do not. Some formats support multiple columns. Some formats, uh, multiple columns are not supported. So if you have specific questions, um, I would be happy to provide some more information to you afterwards. Um, but usually, you want to save in as many formats as possible. So again, that goes back to um, allowing the user to choose what works best for them and what works best for one person might not work best for another. Um, so providing as many options as possible um, is, is the best way to go.
We're also going to speed through some information on some basic accessibility checkers. This is mainly to make you aware of their existence. Uh, we're not gonna go and understand each one, but there is lots of good information that already exists out on the web um, for each different accessibility checker and how to use them. Word documents um, has a built-in accessibility checker and uh, you can open the file or open your document, click file, check for issues, check accessibility. There are a couple different ways to get there, but this is the way that is always, uh, that is always there. And then what that does is it pulls up a sidebar and um, it will kind of walk you through if it finds any accessibility errors and it will give you steps at the bottom of how to fix it. Um, and so those instructions, um, I have actually been fairly impressed with how easy they are to use. Um, and then if, if not, um, if you're still wondering, there is lots of good information um, on the web about how to fix each one. And same thing with Adobe Pro. Um, if you have access to Adobe Pro, they uh, have an accessibility checker and you can open your document, go to the tools section. You're looking for the action wizard. Uh, if it's not there, you can go to more tools and click on the add for the action wizard. Then it will be there in your toolbar um, and you click on the action wizard and make accessible. And then it will walk you through um, a lot of prompts. And uh, again, it will pull up a sidebar um, and will link to instructions on how to fix each issue. For online resources um, or for an HTML version, the WAVE accessibility checker um, is a really standard one. Um, you can actually use it in two different ways. You can go to the WAVE website and then plug in a URL of the uh, web page that you want to check, or you can actually get a plugin. And that means any web page or anything that you have up on your screen, you can click on the plugin um, and it will run the accessibility checker for you. My favorite one for online resources um, is the browser extension Totally. And uh, you can learn more about Totally um, online. If you just uh, type it into any search bar, uh, it will come up at the very beginning. And that one, uh, again, it's an extension. Whatever web page you're on, you click the Totally button of your browser extension, and it pulls up a menu um, that will highlight different accessibility uh, errors or flags on your screen. And those are just a couple. Uh, there are more accessibility checkers. If you have one that you use and really like, um, I would be really interested in knowing that. So please add that to the chat. And the accessibility checkers, they don't check everything. So they're very helpful tools, uh, especially when you're first getting started, but they don't always check color contrast, for example. Um, I think Word now is just starting to highlight color contrast. Um, it wasn't included in their initial round. Um, if someone else knows, uh, please let me know. And, but for example, it won't tell you if headings are used um, or if those header styles are used. So if you have a really long document um, and you don't have any, if it's over a certain page length, it will provide you a tip it will say you might want to think about having headers, but it can't tell you if they're used correctly, if they make sense, um, some things like that. 
and then reading order. Uh, so documents with multiple columns or, you know, oftentimes textbooks have, you know, call outs or side columns um, or a text box or something. Uh, and so making sure that things are read in the correct order and that those call out boxes aren't read in the middle of another paragraph um, or something, the, that's all within the reading order. Um, and the accessibility checkers don't check that. The reading order um, is a little bit more tricky. We don't have time to go into exactly how to do it. Um, but if that's the step you're on and you want more information, um, I can provide you with some good training resources um, for where I learned more about reading order and how to fix that in PDFs. And lastly, before we end with time for questions, I really want to drive home uh, the importance of self-care. And we cannot be perfect at everything, nor is perfection the goal. Um, because we know now that 100% accessible does not exist. So, you know, even when we're thinking about accessibility, um, that's a great first step. But, you know, and learning um, and incorporating new skills um, is great, but it does take a lot of time. And so just remember to be kind to yourself and practice self-compassion along the way. Um, and we have covered a lot of information um, in a small amount of time, but if you want more information, uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to provide that to you. And along those lines, uh, there are some good resources linked from your uh, Pub 101 curriculum and uh, I think some of these were mentioned at the very beginning, including this accessibility toolkit that has a great checklist for accessibility in it. Um, and then some more information on creating those alt text descriptions. Um, and then this last one um, is a libguide uh, from MSU, and that has a lot of links uh, for different document types. So if you're looking um, for more detailed instructions for um, how to make a Word document accessible, uh, you might find links there as well. And with that, I know that there was some activity going on in chat. Um, I couldn't see it all along the way. Uh, but what questions do you have? Well, thank you, Jackie, first of all, for sharing all that information. I have been keeping my eye on chat and I will do my best to uh, capture and sort and organize. So if I miss anything, everyone, please help. But there has been great conversation, lots of people offering resources and uh, ideas to one another. I think the first unanswered question in the chat is from Kelly, um, or excuse me, from Amy. And Amy says, one of our challenges is providing alt text that does not give away the answers to students like on an exam. What sort of ideas or workarounds are there for that kind of situation? And maybe it would be helpful, um, Amy, I don't know if you have like a specific uh, case study that you're thinking of or a specific subject area or exam, maybe it would be helpful to hear that story. Maybe the science from science department. Good question. Coming to, let's see, my first thought without seeing like a specific example is, um, you know, what is the information, not the, the answer to the quiz or test or whatever, but besides the answer, what information is the user getting from that image? If they are getting like the answer, 
then like if the if the answer is only in the image and you can't describe it in a way that would lead them to the answer without it, then honestly, you may want to think about uh, that question um, and what it's getting at. Um, but within the science department, um, I'm thinking of like a chemical particle or something. Man, that's a really good question. It is. I would say um, I would have to probably look at the specific examples. Um, we have, and looking at the chat, we've had to have alternative questions posed, but so many in science, especially. Um, yeah, and identify the tissue type shown in a micrograph. Oh. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. That's a really tricky one. Um, yeah, we can take some time and come back to it after yeah. doing a little recon. That is a tough one. Um, I'm racking my brain too to think about. Uh, if other participants have, know oh, yeah. of anything, please share. <laughs> Of course. Um, let's see. So that was Amy. Was there another question? I see a lot of, oh, from Sarah. What are your thoughts about Google Docs? It's great for adaptable OER, but I have the impression it's not as good for accessibility as Word is. Do you have, do you care to weigh in on that, Jackie, or others? Um, I think that for the most part, what I have seen is that they offer a lot of the same functionality. Um, there are a couple things. I'm more familiar with the differences, honestly, between Excel and Google Sheets. Um, but I think that Google Docs does a fairly good job, um, especially getting at a lot of the basic accessibility um, best practices. You can do a lot of the similar things that you can do within Word. Um, and so again, it kind of comes back to your end user. There might be some users where something specifically in Word um, is needed, but as a general, uh, in general, I would say Google Docs does a fairly good job at getting um, at um, at a lot of accessibility features as well. Um, if anyone knows of specific downfalls of Google Docs, um, I would be happy to learn as well. And what if the alt text described, uh, that's going back to the, um, going back to the science image one. So I'll yeah, yeah. Um, I have a couple questions as well as as well as reflections, especially about the, um, you know, self care and not always getting it perfect. So there were questions about transcript and live transcripts in this very zoom call. And so I thought I had it enabled and I apologize that it was not going. Um, and then there was a question about the distinction between closed captioning and live transcript and somebody um, clarified that you know a transcript is searchable it's a standalone document while closed captioning is you know attached embedded in that video which is really helpful um, i will also offer a tip if you are recording video and zoom users one of the things i learned last week um well relearned to be honest since the last time i hosted a zoom call is that if you want zoom to automatically record a transcript you must record to the cloud and not to your computer. So that's why there is not a transcript available, unfortunately, from our first meeting, but there will be for all subsequent meetings. So there's a lot of trial and error like that, especially if you're using 12 different tools throughout your workday. Um, you know, it can sometimes be a challenge if you get out of the habit of, of using one to remember how to um, do all the things. Uh, the other question I have is from a member of our publishing cooperative who is creating, as you recommended, Jackie, various file types of an open textbook, which includes EPUB and PDF. 
And um, EPUB, as I understand it, is still considered to be the most accessible. And so making the EPUB um, as accessible as possible is the first goal. And then with that in mind, how does one decide you know, what to do with the PDF if this other file type is available, it's very accessible, and um, in addition to sort of time and capacity constraints, are there other considerations for making that PDF accessible as well? Yes, uh, thank you for reminding me about this question. Um, I think that this might, the answer might vary um, depending on your situation. Ultimately, um, you know, providing options so that people have something that works with their assistive technology um, is kind of the end goal. So if you have an EPUB that is very accessible and I can see not going as further with the PDF, um, there are, you know, there are simple things that you can do. If you start with a Word document, um, your headings will transfer, you know, so um, it means that a, a PDF can still be uh, more accessible than, uh, than some, but I would think that it kind of, you kind of have to weigh like how much time you have, um, if it's something you do all of the time um, and, you know, can just operationalize it and kind of make it as part of the process, um, then yeah, shooting for the most accessible is, is great. Um, but if you do provide a more accessible option, um, one of the benefits of PDF is that it pro it preserves the visual layout very well um, for sighted users. And it will pr preserve that layout when printed. Um, and so that might be useful, um, but those things can be preserved without going um, into all of the detail of making sure the tags um, line up with everything. So um, I don't think I have a, solid, like, here's your one answer. Um, but I do think that if you provide a more accessible option, it does mean that um, like a PDF might be getting at that visual, um, a visual user and the layout uh, more so. Um, so I hope that is clear. I don't want to provide a, just one single answer because um, it may vary depending on your situation. Um, but I do think that it is uh, it is okay to kind of weigh your different options um, and what they're providing to your users and not go 100% um, on every single format, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thinking out loud on that with us. Um, there's been further conversation in the chat, which is wonderful. We are running low on time. And so with two minutes remaining, and I don't think any other questions at this time, I'll go ahead and start wrapping up. So Jackie and I will work together um, on addressing the very challenging question of how to provide descriptive text for images in an exam environment and uh, get back to you in the class notes. And of course, as always, welcome all of you to chime in on that. And I will follow up uh, with an email this week and look forward to seeing all of you next week. So please join me in thanking Jackie for sharing her expertise. And we also thank all of you for sharing your resources, expertise, questions, and answers in the chat. And um, best wishes for your week and see you next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate the information.